has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in him. And you know, there's a passage of scripture that I was looking for just a few minutes ago, but I couldn't quite find, and it says, rejoice and be in high spirits. That's what we're supposed to do, morning by morning and day by day and hour by hour. Be in high spirits. Rest in high spirits. Walk, live, talk, knowing who you are and what you possess. And you know, it's awful hard to have uh, a real heavy feeling when you look at Jesus and know who you are in relationship to Jesus. And one of the greatest things that the Lord ever said to me that has carried me so far in my Christian walk, one day in my prayer time, the Lord spoke to me and he said, Evelyn, don't look at circumstances. Pay no attention to what people say. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. And I took it and I nurtured it and I chewed on it and I began to wallow in it. And I began to bring both the criticisms that I received and I took them to Jesus. And I said, now Lord, what are you saying to me through it? I began to take the applauses that people gave me and I took them to Jesus and let him tell me what he was saying. And it, and it kind of revolutionized my life. And I didn't know that I was getting free from the bondage of being in, uh, bound by the opinions of other people. But there's a passage of scripture that I want to I want to share uh, with you today that, that kind of goes along uh, with what I'm talking about. And I didn't know I was going to get up and do this, but anyhow. In Colossians 3, Ephesians and Colossians are, are two of my favorite passages of, of scripture. And in the 15th verse, it says, and let the peace Colossians 3.15 is where I'm at. I'm using the Amplified Bible, so my Bible reads a little differently than yours. And it says, and let. And you know, let is the first recorded oral word of God. God said, let, in other words, permit, allow everything that has held back light, permit light to come, and light came forth. And it means to allow or permit. And he says to us, let the peace, allow the peace, the soul harmony which comes from Christ rule and act as an umpire continually in your hearts, deciding and settling with finality all the questions that arise in your mind. And in that peaceful state to which as members of Christ's one body you were also called to live and be thankful, appreciative, giving praise to God always. Let the peace, the soul harmony which comes from Christ, rule and act as an umpire continually in your heart. Deciding and settling with finality all questions that arise in your minds. And in that peaceful state to which as members of Christ's one body you were also called to live, be thankful, appreciative, giving praise to God always. Let the word spoken by the Christ, the Messiah, have its home in your hearts and minds and dwell in you in all its richness. And as you teach and admonish and train one another in all insight and intelligence and wisdom and spiritual things, sing songs and, and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody to God with his grace in your hearts and whatever you do, no matter what it is, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and in dependence upon his person, giving praise to God the Father through him. Those three passages of scripture are kind of yummy to me. And you know, anything, you know what yummy means? You know, I, uh, my favorite pie is lemon meringue pie. 
And you know that uh, scientists say that you only have taste buds in the mouth. So if you want to savor it, you kind of put it in your mouth, mm, and roll it around a little bit, you know, because the moment you swallow it, you lose it. <laughs> you have, it no longer has any taste, but as long as you're, you know, kind of walling it around, it's kind of yummy. And, the word, and, you know, we've been admonished to taste and see that the Lord is good. And we need to learn to take the word and wallow it around, kind of like a cow, you know, chewing its cud over and over again, you know. And even, you know, and you know how cows chew. They chew and then they take and then they burp and it goes down and then it stays down a little while and then they burp it up and chew it over again, you know, and over and over again. And this is what we need to do with the word of God. And here it's saying, allow it to have the rule in our heart. Let it so live in us that it becomes bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh. And let the word of God settle every question that arises in your heart and in your mind. Let it act as an empire. Con always deciding with finality everything that comes into your mind. And you know, I'll give you a definition for peace. It just blew my mind when I found it. And I think that's one of the greatest phrases that's ever been then pen blow your mind because actually in Christ you got to have your mind blown so that you can even understand what he's talking about. Because the mind is at enmity with the spirit it fights. And as long as we're trying to comprehend things with our mind, we will never come to the truth. But it says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is, not what he thinks with his mind, but in his innermost being, in the spirit. And that the spirit is to have the rule and bring the mind subservient to the spirit so that the mind can be the instrument that God ordained it to be in the beginning, the vehicle through which the inner and the outer world was reached. And so he said, let the peace, in uh, 2 Peter 1, verse 2, it says, it talks about the grace and the peace of God. And if we ever get the reality of the first gift that has been given to us, when we came to know Jesus Christ or accepted Jesus Christ or was converted or saved or regenerated or whatever your terminology is in your denomination, one of the first things that you experienced was the storms were abated. The turmoil ceased. You were filled and flooded with peace. And regardless of what our circumstances were or what our situation was or how we came to know Jesus Christ, basically when we get through telling the story, the thing that we all have in common was that peace entered into our lives. And he says that, Peter says that peace is perfect well-being. All the necessary good, all spiritual prosperity and freedom from fears Agitating passions and moral conflicts. That is what has been given to you. Now, if we could learn to live as believers in that kind of reality, that we could wake up morning by morning saying, this is the day that the Lord has made, and I choose to rejoice and be glad in it. And when you realize that we belong to God. I belong to God. And therefore, God is responsible for me. And that he engineers every circumstance and every situation that comes into my life. It's got to come through him in order to get to me. And that everything, whether I approve of it or not, is working together for my good. Well, you know, that's a whole different mindset, you see. But to realize that God only has the best in store for me, not even the good, but the best. And, you know, I, I like that passage of Scripture where he tells, um, and a lot of people you might differ with me, but you know when the Lord told Israel to go in and possess the land, he said, destroy everything. And we think, oh, my, he said, men, women, children, houses, cattle, land, destroy everything. Okay. And we think about that being so cruel. But he had a point. He said, anything that you don't destroy is going to rise up in the end and destroy you. Amen. So he said, get rid of it all. 
And he says, whatever you do, don't fraternize with the people. Stay pure. We come to know Jesus Christ, and we don't mind getting rid of the bad things. Oh, we'll lock them off in short order. But the good, or there can't be anything wrong with this. And we'll, we'll, we'll uh, have the sin of our car, and we'll hide our little idols and the good little things and cover them, our, you know, put them under our skirts like God can't see what's under our skirts, you know. And then wonder why we're not blessed. And he said, there's sin in the camp. And I said, what do you mean they're sitting in the camps? And we did everything he told us, and oh, you know, somebody's sitting on some idols. Yeah. And God is one of the greatest, the Spirit of God is one of the greatest iconoclasts you've ever seen, huh? <laughs> <laughs> He's the <an> idol breaker. <laughs> <laughs> He's the image breaker. He comes along and just breaks up all the images, and you know, he peeps our whole card. Do you know what a whole card is in Colorado? How many of you do not know what a whole card is? Oh, all you good Christians. <laughs> well, I have not I have not been a Christian all my life. I was saved. <laughs> See, I was saved and I was out there in the world. <laughs> and one of the things I like to do when I was out there, uh, you know, dabbling, is uh, I like to play poker. Okay, and I like to play five card stud. That's where most of the money was, you know. And uh, in five card stud, you deal four cards face up and one card down, and you bluff with your whole card, you know. And nobody knows what it is, but you, okay. But I got a guard that peeps whole cards, you know. Those are those secret things that nobody knows. <laughs> Y'all don't understand it. <laughs> You're really with me this morning. <laughs> you know, those little secret things that we don't know, that, you know we, that nobody knows that we have, those little things that we do back in the corners, you know. But the Spirit of God will not let us have any peace as long as they're there. And he peeps our whole cards. And, you know, we, we give the devil an awful lot of credit, but we don't know that it's God stirring the pot. And you know anything, you ladies are, um, uh, are good cooks. You look like it. Some of you look like you're very good cooks. <laughs> the evidence is in your husbands. <laughs> and you know, a good cook in making a stew puts the meat on and puts it under a low fire and lets it simmer. Right? And then as it simmers, the scum will come to the top of the pot. Right? And then you, scum the, you take the scum off the pot. Okay? And as you take the scum off, you add a few ingredients, okay? You don't put everything in at one time, do you? Well, y'all don't know how to cook either. <laughs> and the longer the pot cooks, the better it is, okay? And there's some things in, in our lives we've got to put on the back burner. We can't always comprehend them. The Spirit of God will reveal them. And rather than throw them away because you don't understand them, you're wise if you put them on the back burner. And then every once in a while, the Lord will come by and stir the pot. You know, the scum will come to the top, and then he'll put in a few ingredients because he knows that by the time that you need that pot, it'll be perfect for you. Okay. Are, are you following me? You all act like you're stumbling over what I'm saying this morning. Yeah. <laughs> But the thing for us to do is to wake up morning by morning knowing who we are and what we possess and get our eyes off the circumstances and keep our eyes on Jesus and be in high spirits. We're the only one that can be in high spirits. But if you wake up morning by morning exercising yourself in him and realizing that he said he's given me peace, and that peace is perfect well-being, that it's okay regardless of the circumstances that I find myself in, it's all right. Why? Because God is in the midst. Jesus is in the midst. The Holy Spirit is in the midst because they're all resident within me. And wherever we are, there's got to be peace. We're master of the situation. Ain't that good news? You know, we need to grasp with reality, not theory, that in us, right this morning sitting here, where am I? Beside Colorado, where am I? 
Estes Park, Colorado, that in us, right here, right now, having received Jesus Christ, according to the word of God, in Colossians 2, 9, said that in Christ Jesus dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead in a bodily form. Okay? And where's Jesus this morning? I, I beg your pardon? <laughs> And you are made full and have come to complete spiritual stature because in you too dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead in a bodily form. So sitting right here, all of us collectively, in us dwelleth all the fullness of God. God the Father, God the Son, and God, the blessed Holy Spirit, are resident within us this moment. And there's not one thing that can happen to us in any shape, form, or fashion that he can handle. In us, through us, for us, and as us. I'll chew on that. I dare you to chew on it. You know, people say, well, who in the world do you think you are? I don't have to think about it, I know. <laughs> Let the word of God be the final umpire, settling every question that arises in your mind. God, I don't understand it. I'm not going to tell you today I understand how a God so high that I can't get over him and one so wide that I can't get around him and one so low that I can't get under him can't get small enough to get in me. I can't tell you how that is. <laughs> but I tell you, I truly <laughs> believe it. And I tell you, it'll make you simple. We have made the words of Jesus Christ so complicated that nobody can keep them. And Paul kept saying, let's get back to the simplicity of Jesus. Jesus, you said it, I believe it, and that settles it. And all I got to do, if it's so, is act like it. And I guarantee you, if you get simple enough to act like it, he'll back you up. <laughs> it's scriptural. He said, I watch over my word, and then I hasten to perform it. And all God needs is some simple folk. That's all Jesus did. He said, whatever I see my daddy doing, whatever I hear my daddy doing, that's what I do. And the folks got all upset. He said, don't get upset with me. Take it up with my father. <laughs> I'm only doing what he instructed me to do. He said, I'm consumed with the will to do the will of my father. He said, I have no other desire than to do the will of my father. And he, that doesn't make you a puppet, beloved. That makes you so one with him. You know, when, when we look at what it cost Jesus and what it cost God the Father to secure our salvation and what it cost the Holy Spirit to become resident in the heart of men and in light of the cross of Jesus Christ, how can we afford to be anything less than what he says we are when we profess to love him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe on him should not perish but have everlasting life. The son not considering himself but gave up the glory that he had with the father for before the foundation of the world and took upon himself sinful flesh and walked among men that he could take us back to the father. And he said, oh, it's expedient, it's necessary that I go away, because if I don't go away, he said, I can't return. But I'm going away, but I'm going to not leave you helpless. I'm going to send another, just like unto myself, that will be in you and dwell in you and live in you and guide you and direct you. And the Holy Spirit gave up his place beside the Father and became resident in the hearts of men. The whole Godhead went through a traumatic experience of separation in order for you and I to become one so that the Father's heart could be pleased. But when Jesus walked the earth as a natural man, he never knew 
what it was to be separated from the Father until he took your and my sins upon himself. And that sin, which was so putrid, separated him from God so that he cried out for every man, woman, and boy, and girl that would ever be born in the world, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But he knew that he was one with the Father. We received Jesus Christ. And that puts us back into a state of oneness. And John, Jesus prayed in John 17, the high priestly prayer. He said, Father, for this cause I sanctify myself, that they may be one. I set myself apart to go through and do this task that you've given me to do, that they may be one, even as you and I are one. He said, Father, sanctify them, set them apart by thy truth. He said, thy word is truth. David said, I have hid thy word in my heart, that I might not sin against you. He said, thy word has become a lamp unto my feet. And he ate that word. And he told us to eat that word. And Jesus went on to say, I'm not praying for these 12 here. He said, but I'm praying as many as will believe on me through their words. We've heard the words of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Peter, James. And through these spoken words, through vessels of clay, men, we've come to know Jesus Christ. But instead of entering into that state of oneness that, he, that cost him so much to put us in, we receive Jesus Christ, but mentally we stay separated from God. God's got a mind, I've got a mind. God's got a will, I've got a will. God's got desires, I've got desires. He said, but I come to make it one. He says, grieve not my spirit. The Holy Spirit has to have a mind, he's got will, and he's got emotions. We receive a personality when we receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And the personality of the Lord Jesus Christ resident within us, enhancing our personality, bringing our minds, our wills, and our emotions into a state of oneness with the Father so that we can walk and live and talk exactly like he did. That's why he says, grieve not. So many times we have emotions that are going on inside of us, and they're not really related to us but they're the Spirit of God emanating through us. And because we don't have a handle on those emotions and because we live such a fragmented life in us and live in such a fragmented state of being, we do not allow those emotions to have the right of way because we have not come to the awareness that we're one. As the Father says, we're one. So we have, this has to be worked out in reality in us and through us that I am one, but until we make that decision, that I am one with Jesus. And what did Paul tell us in Romans 8? Therefore there is nothing, no thing that can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Things pending, threatening, natural things, spiritual things. No, he said in all these things, we're more. Anybody can be a conqueror, but a believer is more than a conqueror. And he's saying, God being for us. 20th century, paraphrase Rev. Ev, who's got the audacity to be against me? God being on my side. But the children of God don't have that kind of awareness. We're always striving, always straining, trying to attain. Where are we going to get around to accepting the fact that we have and begin to allow. He said, let, allow. Up until this time, up until the time of Christ, we had no alternative but to be bound by darkness, to live but to live in fear, but to be buffeted about by uh, the moral conflicts and the agitating passions that were going on inside of you. But now, the Reconciler has come. Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and has taken up residence within us through the Holy Spirit living in us. And he has reconciled, redeemed everything that makes us what we are and brought us into right relationship with God the Father. 
But as he was in the world, so, <laughs> hallelujah, so are ye. Like he walked, and you know, the scripture says in, in uh, 1 John 2, 6, he that saith, he that Christ abideth in him, ought as a personal, as a personal gratitude and debt, ought to walk just like he walked. That's what the word says. We ought to walk just like Jesus. Talk just like Jesus. You know what the word walk means? It means live. He tells us to take off the old and put on the new. Behold, I make, not you. He said, behold, I make all things new. Everything, not a little bit. Not that that I can grasp. He said, behold, I make all things new. And you know, the moment he steps on board our ship of life, he sanctifies everything. The sanctifier has come. The cleaner up has come. And do you know that, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. You just, get, you just get high thinking about all the things he's done. And you know, the thing that we have to grasp beyond a shadow of a doubt, that not only has he done them in the word, but he's done them in me. You know, it just blows my mind to read the word to find out what I've got and what I possess. And, when, and then it grieves my heart when I realize that I am living beneath my privilege in Christ Jesus when I look at the cross and see what it caused God to give it to me. And here I am sitting down on the stools to do nothing, groveling and groaning, trying by my own bootstraps to pull myself up to get good enough to receive. And he said, here. I said, well, I didn't what's that? <laughs> oh, that's too much. I can't take that. He said, I know, but take it anyhow. Suffer it to be so. <laughs> that's what it means. Allow it to happen. You know, when Jesus went to John, and John realized that Jesus was the Christ, and, and he was acting like any other man, though, he, you know, they, all the sinners were coming to be baptized, and here comes Jesus. And he said, oh, no, 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 you know, what are you doing down here? You know, like, you're different, you know. I'm not even worthy to unlatch your shoes, you know. You know, I'm backing away, and Jesus said, that's all right, John, I know you know, but just suffer yourself to lie yourself to lie. no I can't baptize you he said oh go ahead and do it anyhow <laughs> and John had to succumb because Jesus was identifying with humanity in every form and he's saying to us constantly day after day after day I know you're not good enough I didn't leave it to your goodness I took your righteousness which was nothing but filthy rags I stripped you and I took away your unrighteousness, and then I wouldn't leave you naked and unclothed. I clothed you with myself. I clothed you. I overshadowed you with myself, with my righteousness, with my love, with my poise, with my dignity, with my integrity. I put all of me in you, and all I ask you to do is live. Live in the reality of who you are. Let's live life together. Get your eyes off of what you have been and deal with what you are. We spend so much time remembering what we have been and trying to kill the old that we never get acquainted with the new. <laughs> I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. I used to drink and smoke and run around. You know, I don't do things no more. Because I don't have no desire to do them. Because something was taken out. The desire to do that was taken out and something new. I'm preaching now. <laughs> and 30 years ago, if somebody had told me I was going to be a preacher, I'd have said, you're crazy. But now I don't want to do anything else. But I do it sleeping, walking, talking. I always got a sermon going somewhere. <laughs> Even when I'm trying not to preach, I'm preaching. <laughs> because it has consumed me. And I can't tell when I'm doing it and when I'm not doing it. The other folks know. <laughs> you see, do you get the point of what I'm trying to, to stress? He said, let, allow. In other words, if we stop trying to be, 
what we are and just be, we could see the manifestation of the reality of Jesus Christ in our life. I don't know how to be a Christian, but guess what? I am. And I can get up just every morning and just be me. And I don't have to strive to get in the presence of God. The presence of God is in me. Oh, y'all don't hear me. <laughs> so that if I'm running, Jesus and I are running. If I go to the beach, Jesus and I are at the beach. If I'm playing ball with my kids, Jesus and I are playing ball with my kids. If I'm lying down, if I'm bathing, or if I'm catching a plane, I don't have to say, come on, Jesus, and meet me when I get there, because we're going together. <laughs> Why? Because he's in me. How many of you got up this morning and went to the breakfast table and decided that you were going to leave your kidneys back in the, in the, in the, <laughs> the cabin? I know some of you wish you could leave them sometimes, but, uh, but how many of you actually leave them? How many of you left your... Uh, 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 gallbladders this morning if they haven't been removed. <laughs> okay. Anybody leave your gallbladder this morning? How many of you sat down at the table and looked at the food that you have and said, my God, how am I going to digest this? Huh? Or how many of you left your hours of Langerham this morning? Owls of Langerham. You mean to tell me you got something going in you and you don't even know you got it? <laughs> now that really speaks to me. The Isles of Langerham are the adrenals at the end of the pancreas that stimulate the pancreas to cause it to produce insulin. Which is very vital to your health. Right, Dr. Fry? Okay? And you've got all that going for you and you didn't even know it. Now that really says a whole lot to me. Huh? That says a whole lot to me, and, it does, and, and because you don't know they're there, it doesn't stop them from functioning, does it? Huh? That does it? Because half of you didn't know you even had such a thing. And you've been carrying it around since the day one, you know? And it's been functioning all that time, because if it wasn't functioning well, you'd be sick. And be very much aware. And it's just that simple. Christ becomes resident within us. And we're always popping inside, going, searching, looking, you know, trying to find out, are you still there? You know, then he jump out, you know. <laughs> he don't take no vacations. He don't, you don't decide to go to the mountains. And he says, well, I'm going to the ocean this week and go to the ocean. <laughs> huh? He said, I'll come in and make you my permanent abode. He's a tenant that can never, ever be evicted not because you're so stinking good but because he refuses to get out man that's enough to make you have a downright glory fit <laughs> there's nothing that i can do to make god leave me alone i can turn my back on him and go as far as the east is from the west and he he'll be trodden right along <laughs> trucking right on and you know <laughs> You know, I love a shepherd. You ever watch a shepherd? A shepherd gets out in front of the sheep and he leads them. He don't even bother to look back to see if the sheep are following him. Because a good shepherd always has a sheepdog. And it's the job of the sheepdog to catch the ones that are straying. And don't you know that the Holy Ghost is nothing but God's sheepdog? And he gets on your track and goes to nipping and tucking at your heels until you get back where you belong? That's his job. But he said, let this soul harmony, let the peace of God rule in your heart. Let it rule. Let it have its place of preeminence. And peace, perfect well being. I'm okay. Whew, I get up this morning, and what I didn't do yesterday is under the blood. And all my sins of yesterday have gone. The slate is white clean because I took care of business last night and said, Father, forgive me. And he said, okay, yeah. 
you know? And he wiped, wiped, wiped the slate clean. I woke up this morning spanking brand new, sun shining, bound out of bed. This is the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I don't know what the day is going to hold, but hallelujah, I know the one that holds the day. Amen? And guess what? And guess what? We're going to walk this walk together. And we're going to talk this talk together. And there's no place, no corner that I can turn that he is not going to turn with me. And if I stumble and fall, which I generally do, he falls right on down there with me. And he says, come on, Ab, get up. I fell the other night out here. And I was with Dean, and the first of you that thought we were singing a chorus, because together we said, God, have mercy. <laughs> I don't know what flat or key he was in, but it came out all right, sounded like harmony to me. <laughs> and we got on up, you know, and, and went on down the road. Oh, it's a, God's a wonder. And we make him so hard and so complicated. And that when we move to the next thing, and some of y'all are going on like this. But believe it or not, Jesus is going to go down to the friendship hall and have nip ups this morning. <laughs> what? I said, believe it or not, Jesus is going to go down to the friendship hall and do nip ups this morning. <laughs> Rhythms. <laughs> and he's going to stand tall in M this morning and he's going to tell M, raise your left arm. Raise your right arm, your left foot, you know, and he might even make you do a Father Abraham. And Jesus is going to be doing Father Abraham because he knew all about him. Just that simple. And those of you that don't choose to do it, if you're going to take a walk, Jesus is going to take a walk too, but he ain't going to leave none of us alone. Because he's in us if we name the name of Jesus. You know what this kind of reality will do? you have any idea what this kind of reality will do for you? It'll take the stress, it'll take the strain out of living for Jesus. You know, he doesn't want us to, to struggle and strive to produce. He, hasn't worked, he doesn't want us working for him like a machine. He simply wants to live with us as people. He wants us to live with him as a person. He wants us to come in fellowship with him. He's interested in developing relationship. He wants to be as close to you and so intimate with you. That's why you can talk to him in the bathroom. You can talk to him in the shower. You can sit on the commode and talk to him and he won't fall off the throne. <laughs> because he knows. He was human and he knows the kind of things that you have to do. Yeah. And you can be as intimate with him as you choose to be. And I'll tell you, this kind of reality will make you so aware of the Christ. That wherever you go, he goes. It will even change your attitude. It will make you be more considerate of where you take Jesus. When you realize Christ is in you. When you realize that Christ is in you, that the creative word of God has become resident within you. The creative word of God has become resident within you and that the very words that you speak bring life. You'll be careful about what you say because you know the power that in the creative word is now resident within you. And you can speak into existence all manner of things. That's why the word says, put away idle jesting and foolish talking and all that kind of sort of stuff. Because of the creative word that is resident within you. That you give voice to. If we only grasp the reality of who we are and what we possess. And if we will allow the word to so live in us, the living word, the Christ, and the spoken word uniting and becoming one in us, and we by our lives giving flesh to the word of God, 
because Jesus Christ sat his body at the right hand of the Father. And all heaven is upset because there's a man sitting at the right hand of the Father. The angel says, what is a man that thou art mindful of him? You made him a little lower than the angels, yet you have exalted him above. And said, he'll even judge. But when Jesus came to indwell us by his spirit, his body stayed at the right hand of the Father, constantly to make intercession. And he comes and indwells us by his spirit, and we become his body. He has no hands but ours. He has no feet but ours. He has no tongue to speak. He's got, he's got the language, but no tongue, no voice to speak it. And he needs our voice. He needs our hands. He needs our eyes. He needs our ears. He needs our tongue. He needs our hearts. He needs our feet. He needs the whole of us. And he said in Hebrews, he said, I have come for it is written in the volume of the book to do thy will, for thou hast prepared for me a body. We become that body. And Paul admonishes us to present our bodies unto the Lord. And then don't get excited because you haven't done anything. That's just a reasonable service. He gave up a body for you. But he said, if you want to do something, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, by having new ideals and a new attitude. And the enemy of your soul does not want you to grasp the reality of what I'm talking about. Constantly be striving to attain. Never get around to get into the place that I've got it and act like it. He don't care how much you pray. He don't come at how much you fast and how much you grovel and how much you've grown, just don't believe the word of God to the point that you'll act like you believe it. Because people are brought into the kingdom by what they see. Christianity is more caught than it is taught. And it's a way of life. And when I get simple enough and you get simple enough to believe it to the point that your whole life manifests what you believe, people don't even have to like you, but they'll take notice. And that's what I'm trying to get across. He said, let the soul harm me the peace of God. And what is peace? He said, perfect well being, all the necessary good, all spiritual, all spirituality, all freedom from fears and agitating passions. And that's what God said. But let me tell you what, what Jesus said. He said, my peace I give unto you, not like the world gives, John 14, 27, do I give? He said, I give it and bequeath it to you. Do not let, do not permit, do not allow your heart to be troubled. Neither let or allow or permit it to be afraid. And then he uses road signs. And you know that big red road sign? When you're flying down the highway, and you've got those red, big, bold, white letters, stop! <laughs> stop what? He said, stop allowing. Stop allowing yourselves to be agitated and disturbed. And he said, you stop allowing. Why? I've given you my peace. Now that's my part. Now it's your part to respond. So how are you going to respond? Not letting your heart be troubled? and stop allowing yourselves to be agitated and disturbed. And do not permit yourselves to be fearful, intimidated, cowardly, and unsettled. Why? Because I've given you my peace. I've taken up residence within you. What can unsettle God? What can surprise Jesus? What can cause him to be disturbed? And he's living in us, is he not? And if he's not disturbed in us, why do we need to be disturbed outside? Amen.